Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Tom Lin, and I have the distinction of speaking with uh, the inimitable John Stepwin today. Uh, and we're going to be taking up again a theme that we've been a constellation of themes uh, the relationship between the technologies of our time. And, you know, we can go so many directions with that, but uh, we can also look at aesthetics and the relationship of artistic and cultural formation as opposed to production, right? We can maybe interrogate that distinction. I don't know. Uh, and the manner in which technologies ramify for those processes. Um, you know, again and again, and then, you know, maybe you can build from this, John. When I yeah. run up against people who, be, who are enthusiastic about the deployment of digital modalities for artistic production, whether in a general way through things like Photoshop or whatnot, or in these newer ways through, I always want to say so-called AI, because it's not intelligent. Like if you just allow an understanding of intelligence to arise in your consciousness, you realize that the, these structures are incapable of exhibiting actual intelligence. But there's a, an effort to treat this phenomenon as, as essentially novel. However, when I look at Walter Benjamin's essay, uh, The Work of Art in um, an Age of Mechanical Reproduction, I have difficulty finding what's changed. Doesn't, you know, I'd be like, so like yeah. Benjamin realizing just the capacity to replicate images and so forth en masse. Uh, induces a, a displacement from the, the concrete. And I don't see that we've really gone so far beyond what he was identifying with his analysis, but yeah. maybe you could build on that, or maybe you well, could have the distinction between, let us say, mechanical and digital production or reproduction. Um, <clears throat> well, you've introduced um, about a half dozen topics there. <laughs> that, Sorry. No, the, no, no, it's very good. That, go, that with, are, go with what you feel. Yeah, no, because positive. because they they all interconnect and they all overlap and, and you can't really uh, discuss one uh, without the other. But but let's begin with since you mentioned Benjamin's article, and that's become a, a very well-known piece, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Uh, it's, it's on a lot of uh, reading lists, syllabi at different universities. Um, I suspect it's, it's taught badly often, but uh, because Benjamin's, Benjamin's very difficult and it's very hard to read a single essay of Benjamin separate from um, a, a larger body of his work and, and his historical place and relationship to the other Frankfurt uh, thinkers, to, to show them to, to uh, a lot of people. And, and uh, in any event, no, to answer your question very simply, no, I don't, I, on one level, we haven't progressed at all, but, but this raises a host of other questions and begs a number of questions. Uh, so, so let me put a pin in that, as they say these days, for one second. Um, I was talking with Johan, who we both know, Johan Edebo, earlier today, we were talking with Uppsala University about this project in a series of seminars. Uh, and the, the topic of technology, digitalization, artificial intelligence, which, which you correctly point out is misnamed. Uh, and because this is, it's an inescapable topic. Uh, it is a marketed phenomenon right now, AI. Uh, it's everywhere and the chat box, uh, GPT or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> has, has become a, a massive, uh, 
a massive investment, number one, and so it is going to be marketed and you're going to see a lot of press about it and a lot of hyperbole about it and a lot of exaggeration about it. Uh, artificial intelligence is essentially a text prediction uh, at, a, at a very rapid rate. Uh, and it's, it's as such kind of remarkable, I suppose, but that's what it is. It has nothing to do with consciousness or sentience or thinking. And when you start to get, I mean, this raises this whole other yet third topic, which is this movement of transhumanism um, and all the futurists and uh, the people like you know, uh, Harari who, oh. God. you know, is, is predicting that we're going to have implants that read your thoughts and so forth. Right. Now, the, here, is, here is a fundamental problem with, with this kind of discussion because it's, it vulgarizes uh, the entire discourse. You don't read thoughts. Thoughts are not a scroll that exists in your brain that is constantly un, being unrolled and read or something. That's not what that's not what consciousness is. There's no thought per se to read. Uh, it, it's an absurdity, but it, but it is interesting because in fact, nobody can define yet what consciousness is. It remains the great mystery, the most elusive topic in philosophy probably. We have yet to resolve the mind body problem or, or any of the kind of dualistic notions that that you know perhaps began with plato but certainly with descartes and with the enlightenment and then we have to talk about the enlightenment but the point here is that artificial intelligence is not related to consciousness that's not what it does it's a computational device that has remarkable achievements, but it has nothing to do, there's not, our robot overlords are not gonna take over the world and, and control us. All of that runaway AI stuff is, is I suspect just a marketing tool. I'm not, I can't, it's hard for me to believe that anybody actually thinks this stuff is true, but, but maybe they do. Well, I mean, uh, I encountered, I'm sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go I, mean, ahead. I feel that it's more than something which is, is marketed. I, I feel, at least with respect to, I mean, the community well, involved with artificial intelligence in, a, in, a, in an advocating sense and machine learning and so forth. When I listen to them discuss the matter, technicians I'm talking about, not, right. you know, marketing gurus or whatever. And actually, I'm main I, I had a, a person who's a who, who who identifies as an advocate of transhumanism on an interview with one yesterday, just as a counterpoint. And they are invested uh, sincerely in the project and in ways that sometimes leave me astonished. Uh, well, this, once you sort of like know the sausage, yeah, no, and well, um, yeah, let me let me just and well, go go ahead, go ahead because I because you're quite right, there are people that are deeply invested in, but but see, this is the this is because and this becomes perhaps the biggest topic we'll we'll address tonight in a sense is that people people believe marketing. People no longer can think critically and make those educated, informed, experienced judgments about what is marketing, what is what is real science, what in quotation marks. And and this this raises a question about artificial intelligence in quotes um, as ideology, as as the reproduction of ideology, and and. That's a massive topic, but so I just wanted to say that yes, of course, people there are people that believe it. I mean, I I think they're horribly misguided, uh, and it's almost delusional. But but 
Yes, they do. But please finish your thought because I don't want to interrupt you. Well, I mean, you sort of led into it with the characterization of, uh, of an ideology. Uh, I'm almost tempted to take a, though I'm not that well trained, but to wonder if a, a, a psychoanalytic approach can be brought to bear here. You know, we use the word artificial intelligence, but these uh, vital metaphors spring up all over the place when you talk about these fundamentally computational uh, frameworks, right? We're talking about digital right. abacai or abacuses. That's what they all, all that they really are. And what's lost is that their significance or meaning is the consequence of human interpretation, which is imposed from without on their output. But there's almost like a yearning to understand the machine as actually alive and having agency. So they, they've got neural networks, for example. They're artificially yeah. intelligent uh, and they learn. You know, they, even the notion that they're learning is, is to me, they're, they're, there's an incredible disjunction between the content of the metaphors which are being applied to these devices and the reality of these devices. So I wonder if there is a yearning to sort of um, uh, surrender our own agency over to this system uh, as a response to the sense of despair, which can be elicited by the overwhelming uh, ubiquity of capital. I, 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 well, I, OK, I yeah, look. <laughs> um, I have written three or four posts, articles on my blog, uh, specifically about the psychoanalytic dynamic with AI, the allure of this artificial intelligence, the, the obvious anthropomorphizing of it, the very name artificial intelligence is, is doing that. Uh, and and I think I think there's very clearly a, a and I I as I say I've written three or four posts about mm -hmm. maybe twenty five thousand words about specifically this and I don't have a real answer for you. I think there is a deep desire for it. Maybe it's as simple as a desire to submit and and be done with the you know um, the mortgage payments and the traffic jams and the bad marriages and the you know everything else that the long work hours the economic precarity maybe people just want to give up with that it's not an accident that Hollywood's constant um, manufacturing creating of, of post-apocalyptic films and, and TV shows uh, are always reconstruction dramas in some fashion, whether it's zombies or alien viruses or whatever it is. Uh, uh, I Am Legend, I think the Will Smith, that's perhaps the quintessential um, example of this and, and uh, the late Cormac McCarthy's uh, The Road is, is a sort of elevated version of this. Um, it's probably his weakest book, but <laughs> probably accounts for why it's his most popular. But um, the, the, because there's the, there, people want the fantasy in these reconstruction narratives, these post-apocalyptic narratives, the desire is to start over. People want the apocalypse, they want it all wiped out so long as they're one of the survivors. And uh, it's a very appealing because, you know, look, these shows never deal with where does clean water come from and, and things like that. Uh, it's very appealing, this, this uh, uh, existence where you get up, you shower, you, there's a couple of, um, attractive women survivors nearby or if you're a woman, uh -huh. male survivors and you go out hunting zombies and you kill a few of them and it's kind of exciting and then you come back and you 
to harvest the vegetables you've been growing in your little victory garden. And, and, and this, is, this is wildly appealing to people. I, and I understand it. It, it. It's appealing to me too. The other thing that those films are about, just as a sidebar observation, is real estate. They're strangely aspirational narratives about real estate. I Am Legend, again, being, I hope that's the right title. I can't remember. I believe you're uh, correct, yeah. Um, is about that once mankind is wiped out, geez, you could just go pick any brownstone on Washington Square and, and own it. You could go pick, you know, <laughs> any any house in Big Sur anywhere. There's uh, the... This is very appealing. So so couple that to the fact that that also all the evils of the world have been wiped out and we're starting over and we're going to do it better this time. We're going to build back better. And where have I heard that before? <laughs> um, these the marketing people are not stupid and Hollywood producers <laughs> are stupid, but they have, they're advised by a few smart people. So, so yes, there's a psychoanalytic relationship to this specific technology that has been deeply anthropomorphized and, and um, is presented as part of this strange, very science fiction influenced uh, storyline that culminates in like Blade Runner and, and these sort of fantasies. It's funny that Philip K. Dick keeps having his stories made into films because he's, he's also kind of de-radicalized whenever Hollywood gets hold of him, but that's a, probably another story. But, but this brings up another question, which is um, science in a, in a broader sense, and I know Johan wrote a piece this morning that was very good about artificial intelligence, chat box, all of this stuff uh, being serving to sort of subsume narratives of dissent. Everything gets sucked into this leveling process because there is there's no there there anymore. With, and, and, and in an era of deep fakes and uh, this massive computational uh, capitalism that exists out there, notions of evidence and truth are ever more uh, fragile. And so that's another, I think, factor that people have, have submitted to in a sense it's like i don't care i don't want the truth is not worth the effort to find it, it, it requires a lot of work a lot of reading a lot of critical thinking it requires i develop my skills and my reason and that's too much work and i understand that i understand that feeling in a lot of people who are overworked and and um, under assault. Um, there is a. Uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I was point, just. Gonna, and I, go ahead. This is going to seem like a contradiction, but it, 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 to what you just said. But I think it's a case of both and not either or. Uh, people also have been discouraged from trusting their, if you like, native intuition or intelligence. And I, to me, yeah. there is so much especially in the past few years, which was transparently deception. It, the, 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 the level of deception, which really I cannot exaggerate. It, 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 and some of it was so transparently obvious that you do not need to have known a, you know, a wit, a shred, an iota of biology to see what was wrong. You just had to look at what was going on in your life, all right? And, and your own common intellect, or I mean, I'm, I'm speaking colloquially here, not that yeah. but is, is sufficient to discern that you are being, you're, that they're lying to you, all right? They, these are lies and they're transparent lies. And people, I, 
have given away trust in that native uh, acumen to, uh, if you like, a culture of expertise and professionalism that is, I think, incredibly hazardous, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so, and, uh, the, and also, by the way, it's actually not, in my view, that difficult to acquire a degree of facility in any domain, right? You don't, right. I'm not saying it's utterly facile, but if you take three months and, and discipline yourself, not that we all have, you know, the space to do that, you can learn an awful lot about what's wrong with conventional virology, all right? And, yeah, yeah. and, it, and so there's also this narrative that the experts have these commanding, almost godlike intellects and, 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 and awareness of reams of material that is beyond you. And it's just, it's just not true. It's not yeah. true. All right. You can do that, you know, but uh, so that's not the contradictory you're saying, because that does take work to do that. Well, well, but, uh, but yeah. it's, it's like a both end, not an either or. Yeah, no, no. Right? That well, comes back to the marketing, you know, people are. But, uh, but th th like this is something anyway. Corey Morningstar and I were talking um, just today about this. Um, that, that sometimes you, you sit back and it's hard to understand what seems so obvious to us, to you, over the last couple of years, has 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 still um, people still cling to these obviously false narratives, these obvious distortions and lies, and um, and this was, of course. Uh, a problem on the left, uh, I, you know, World Socialist web page, Counterpunch, all these leftist outlets, people like, um, oh, what's his name? Um, oh my God, it's in my mind. Um, I'll think you, of it. It's an embarrassment, but, really. But, but, but people absolutely bought into the, the entire World Health Organization proclamations. They defended Anthony Fauci. They defended the lockdowns. They defended mask wearing. They defended the trauma that was inflicted on children, on the elderly, the destruction of national economies, the closure of, of millions, hundreds of thousands of at least mom and pop businesses in the United States and elsewhere. They still to this day will defend this stuff and it's remarkable to me but again we're speaking about if we step back and, and hear during this podcast and look at this and think what why did that happen what what were the mechanisms by which this happened um at at what point did this abdication of of skepticism and distrust of institutional authority, when did that just disappear? I, and I don't know. Now, let me read you. Some. I was looking for this when we were talking um, because I, I, I quoted this the other day in a piece. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is from Guy Debord. And this is something from his comments on Society of the Spectacle that he wrote in 1985 as a sort of follow-up 20 years after he wrote Society of the Spectacle, roughly. So let me read this to you, because it's, it's kind of remarkably prescient. Quote, the vague feeling that there has been a rapid invasion, which has forced people to lead their lives in an entirely different way, is now widespread. But this is experienced rather like some inexplicable change in the climate or in some other natural equilibrium, a change faced with which ignorance knows only that it has nothing to say. What is more, many see it as a civilizing invasion, as something inevitable and even want to collaborate. Such people would rather not know 
the precise purpose of this conquest and how it is advancing, close quote. Um, this is 1985, you know. So, so what we saw in the last couple of years was a, was a kind of distillation and intensification of forces and tendencies and societal trends, historical trends that have, that have been going on for a while, probably at least in their current form since World War II. I, don't, I mean, I don't know, we can, we can debate oh, about that. Yeah. That, but, but, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it didn't just happen. It felt like it just happened. Like in, when we were in the thick of it, there was a, but the conditions of possibility, which enabled that these past three years, this sort of consummation of these processes have been unfolding for decades. Uh, for example, I recently, like was it a few months ago, discovered a Gunther Anders, who was writing in the, uh, you know, uh, Hannah Arendt's first husband. He's not very well known. Yeah, Apparently, I know. I like, like yeah. Uh, but his uh, essay, The World as Phantom and as Matrix, is this incredibly incisive indictment of what happens with radio and television, how it transforms our relationship with the world from one which is reciprocal to one which is uh, unilateral. And it, it, that, that, you know, the world then becomes something which comes to us in our home, as it were. And there's this paradox of how we have a sense of sort of godlike in, 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 in vulnerability as we now receive the world, but it's, it's ultimately castrating because it's not as if we then inflect these events which come in upon us. And right. Anders uh, argues that this is part of a reconditioning of the human individual to reconstitute them to be the mass man, the mass individual, mass consumer, and um, and uh, and it's 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 dangerously effective. And he says, you know, some people want to maintain that there's a an inextinguishable soul which is ultimately re resistant. But he's actually dour on that point. He thinks that it may be a mistake to continue to discuss alienation because perhaps and he's writing this in the late 40s early 50s we've already been so effectively conditioned that we can no longer be alienated this is our very nature to just be consumers yeah, of image yeah. and no, so and, and, what, uh, yeah. i would actually demure from anders uh, in terms of the extent of his dourness but i think his analysis of the phenomenology if you like of what's occurring with mere broadcast media, leave alone what has transpired with the rise of the internet, is absolutely on point and anticipates much of what we're seeing here. So- Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I've, and it's interesting. I have Anders kind of has, has, um, has found a, um, <clears throat> a new popularity the last couple of years yeah, and he's very good. And yeah, um, and he, he's Look, similar to De Boer, right? You know, the, in that this uh, notion of the yeah, spectacle. I and and look, you can go back and find um, find and writing that anticipates the last say 10, 20 years. You can find it in some of the Frankfurt School people, you can find it in uh, De Boer, you, uh, Althusser, you can find it later in, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Steigner. Uh, all of the different people have, 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 Jonathan Beller even more recently has been very, very good. Um, McCrary, uh, Crary, uh, Jonathan Crary. Uh, there are people that that are saying the same thing in different ways and approaching this this stuff there overlaps with different like perspectives. That what? And also, I mean, you know, I don't know them that well, but then there are media analysts, McLuhan, and so forth. And some yeah, ways. I mean, McLuhan was extraordinarily I, reactionary, but but 
really valuable. I mean, I think it, McLuhan's a very interesting study. We could yeah, do a whole I, separate I, podcast on McLuhan because I mean, I would I would like you actually to unpack that a little bit. I don't know him that well, but his name keeps well dropped I, I, here and there, and he's he's uh, both right and wrong. You know, um, his conclusions were wrong because because he was kind of an anti-Marxist in a sense, and but but he was certainly ahead of the curve. On a lot of things, and he understood, he intuited very strongly something um, fundamentally true about about media and and the technology of media and how it was being disseminated. and And he was the first he was the first person, I think, really to say it in the way that he did. That, that there is a there is a sea change in uh, in in this in how humanity looks at itself and its, its expression in this new mass culture that is electronically um, established, mediated. Um, I'm always of a couple of minds here about some of this, and I should probably say this. Um, because on the one hand, we look at the last couple of years, which we both have just kind of um, touched upon the, the, you know, things that happened that were just seemingly unthinkable and that so many people passively went along with it. Many didn't, but there were coercive mechanisms in place. People didn't want to lose their jobs. They didn't want their businesses shuttered. So they went along with it. At a certain point, peer pressure was was had a profound uh, effect on people. I saw that here in Norway. Nobody wanted to have be singled out and called a conspiracy theorist. That most feared epithet uh, in contemporary life. So they shut up and they went along with it and they hoped that it would go away soon. It didn't, but eventually it has kind of subsided. So all of this is true, but on the other hand, there is a tendency, there is a, there is a, uh, a tendency to exaggerate the changes, the, the 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 fact that digital media has transformed life is saying, well, yes and no. Uh, yes, it has, but let's not exaggerate. I mean, the world is more proletarianized than it has ever been. The nature of the class struggle is the same as it has always been. There are cosmetic changes, there are very specific things one needs to look at and, and adjust in, in one's analysis. But the, the, the values that are being imposed top down from the ruling class, the extreme wealth more consolidated than it has ever been, the, the transference of wealth to the very top was pretty much completed under Obama. And the I try to explain to people, private jets never stopped flying during the pandemic. Uh, most of the world's air travel actually is private jets. Those people didn't have to go through the same security protocols that you and I had to go to. Uh, go through and and they didn't have to wear masks and they didn't have to you know submit their children to these ridiculous traumas and 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 alienate them from their friends and so forth. They were exempt. There's about a million examples of this. The people at these at Davos weren't did not arrive wearing masks and social distancing from each other. It's all nakedly obvious. So the, the class dynamic never changed. This, is, this project was brought to you courtesy of 
a very specific uh, faction of of the billionaire class, and we could debate who that is exactly. But it it seemed to me as if in the perhaps the first time in history, at least modern history, that we are seeing unelected officials globally in all these global NGOs and global uh, bureaucracies and institutions exerting policy decisions on governments. And it was the suspension of debate. It was the suspension of due process. It was the suspension of transparency. Uh, Giorgio Gambin, of course, has written about this uh, quite extensively and wonderfully. It was suddenly uh, government by decree, and and as Yacinda, what's her name, Adam, Adam, the New Zealand former New Zealand Prime Minister, said, Don't, "Whatever we tell you is the truth. Nothing else is the truth. Just listen to what we tell you." That that's the, that was the formula, and she said right. that. So, so things that, to that effect. Yeah, go on. Um, go on. Yeah. So I'm just saying that so, there's an awful lot of hyperbole attached to artificial intelligence, and well, let's talk about science then too, physics, quantum physics, and so forth, uh, because it has a relationship to all of this, and it is the legacy of the Enlightenment in one sense that science took a particular kind of direction that maybe we can call scientism now or something. It was, it, it was married to corporate money as was institutions of higher learning universities. And, and it, it took medicine and physics and every discipline you can think of it took them in a certain direction that was aligned with the interests of the ruling class and the people that owned everything and now own pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it, that's all. You, that's like you go to ahead. Rehearse your point back to so they follow you, right? You, you are suggesting that whereas the digital has had enormous consequence in terms of our cultural space and life and what have you. What perhaps is getting lost in the shuffle, shuffle of the, that transformation is the persistence underneath or alongside or in part concealed by that transformation, yeah. the existence of persistent class structure. And, yeah. uh, you know, what I would suggest is that there has been a transformation in class consciousness, uh, both within the ruling class or classes and, you know, those subjugate to their uh, dicta. Um, and it's a bizarre kind of transformation because in both, on both sides of the pole, it seems like the notion of the conflict has been <coughs> and this happens in two different ways so most people don't really believe at least here in america okay in a ruling class they don't really it doesn't register as something which exists <laughs> right? no i know yes that's true there are rich people or there are corporations it's vague and so forth but the idea that there are a class of individuals who have a solidarity and a commitment to controlling the means of production to use the kind of uh, stodgy old fashioned vocabulary, okay, uh, that to leverage your control of the means of production so that most people are in the thrall of their dominance. You, most people think that that's just crazy talk, that there is no such right. thing. That's an old Marxist fairy tale. Um, <laughs> within the ruling class itself, I think they're, they don't really even believe in an underclass anymore at least not as uh, human beings, right? Historically, there was apprehension. You're like, well, we got to keep the serfs in line or whatever. Okay, but, but now they're the contempt 
the contempt of the ruling class has risen to a point which I think is almost without historical precedent. I don't think that they that they see most of the human species as as not even perhaps rising to a level of, of, of a slave. We virtually don't exist in their in their own in, in so far as I can hypothesize what it is to like inhabit their minds. Uh, we we scarcely exist for them, and this is yeah. sort of like. I think why some of the things that they do are so brazen is that they're, they're just not even aware of the most of humanity is humanity. Um, I think that this is something of a change, uh, but you know, I mean, whether that's significant or not is open to question, but uh, I don't know. What do you think there in terms of my response? Well, I, <laughs> no, I think, I think this is a, an astute observation. And, and one that, that I agree with and, and have, have um, made myself in a different way. I think that you, those zombie films, those post-apocalyptic films are really over-determined if we want to be Freudian about them. Um, they're reconstruction dramas. They're also expressions of ruling class anxiety and fear to some degree that the zombies are, are the underclass and they're not human. They're the walking dead and they need to be exterminated. Uh, I think it's a, a sort of secondary trope, if you will, but, but, but it's there. And, I, and I, th I think there's another aspect to, to what you say, because I, I think it's an important observation. And that is that that at this point, 2023, nobody is exempt from the madness that has been unleashed vis-a-vis -vis this, this massive marketing and, and media. That part is new. The saturation that you, you feel that assaults you daily. I think that the people that create that, that own it, suffer from it too at a certain point. I think the ruling class is both more miserable than it has ever been and probably less rational and uh, more delusional than they have ever been. But, but I also think it's very factional. There's, there's, there's clearly a group of people that that believe in depopulating much of the global south. There's others that probably actually believe in the official narrative of, of climate change. I don't know. There's, there's, it's hard to tweeze apart who is behind what, but, but there is, there is this, uh, There is this accompanying, there's two things. There is this accompanying uh, set of, of historical forces with a certain continuity that believes in progress and the perfection of, of society and humanity that it will reach this place of perfection with everything solved and uh, hunger and suffering and everything will be gone. And at least we, the 1% will, <laughs> will live quite happily. But there's, a, but there's a second track that runs alongside this uh, that, that uh, is that we are we are in 2023 now probably in the third generation of human raised by screens, and this includes the ruling class. They watch screens too. That that in that sense, maybe there are robot overlords. I don't know. This the 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 ubiquity of communication by screen is, is hard to deny. Now, uh, 
we're talking about the West though, and this is always important to emphasize, I think, because if you look at, oh, I don't know, France or Luxembourg or, or uh, Germany, something like 80 some percent of households have computers. If you go to Gabon or Uganda or, or uh, Paraguay or pick a place, the percentage of homes with computers is sometimes 6%, sometimes 16%, sometimes 10%. There is a tendency in the West to see things through the lens of white supremacy and through the lens of our own privilege in, in this global uh, mental map that, that has been drawn. There are many places in the world that do not suffer this endless bombardment of, of, of screen information and, and accessibility and all the effects that may or may not be having on people. So, so there's that. But I think that in the West, in the United States, in the UK, in the EU, you are looking at three generations of people that no longer read, often can't read. I, I have substitute taught here in Norway a few times and high school students don't read. I mean, some are very smart and very open. It was encouraging actually, uh, but nobody was telling them what, what I was telling them the day I happened to be substituting. They were hungry for something. They didn't know what, but but they don't read. They don't have any historical uh, knowledge. I was teaching one class about history of the United States and uh, slavery, Puritanism, the genocide of indigenous tribes. And it was pretty much news to them. And, and you know, these are, these are high school seniors. They had a vague idea, yeah, I, I, you know, but, but the particulars they had no idea about. So uh, that's what one is confronted with when we're, when, when we're talking about the relationship between AI, science, digital infrastructure that is upon us and its relationship to culture, because I think this is a critical question. Where is the audience for the arts today? It's not the same audience as when I was directing and writing and producing plays 40 years ago. Those people are gone, they're dead, they're senile, I don't know where they are, but they're not going to theaters. People don't even go to movies anymore the way they did. And uh, for example, the era of serious film art is largely over. That's not to say there aren't good films being made, but few and far between. And the culture for it doesn't exist anymore. Now I taught at the Polish National Film School, international school, famous school for like six years. And I can tell you very few students uh, went to that school because they wanted to be Antonioni or Fassbender or uh, pick, a, pick a great director. They wanted to have successful careers and if that meant directing TV commercials, that was okay too. Uh, it was a career opportunity. So it was hard to talk to those students about why uh, an Antonioni was important, why we could argue whether he was or not, the importance of his own. But, but there, you know, Bresson, anybody, they didn't, it wasn't part of their worldview. And this I think is a, is a critical part of the thing. So you have the rise of AI and chat box and stuff. And there's a writer's strike in Hollywood now, right? 
and because it had essentially become a gig economy for writers and the strike was overdue. But studios are investing in chat box, GPT, whatever it is, to write scripts. They see this as a perfectly reasonable investment and possibility because I think they understand that that's what they've been telling screenwriters for 20 years is to write like chat box. So now they can actually get the real chat box and they, they can cut out the middleman. So these are all things that I've, I think um, are, I have yeah, no answers to, but, right. but I think- I don't know if anyone has like an answer to it, right? I mean, I take <laughs> hope in, I, I draw a certain jaded hope from the fact that a large part of the world is not completely subject to this saturation, but it's a jaded and a qualified hope because it's creepy. And these technologies have an incredibly addictive power. Uh, yeah, I well, that's hope true. that those spaces can somehow resist the influx of uh, these digital opiates. Right, it's uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, are you talking about reading? And like, what is it to really read? Like, even when I mentioned Benjamin in the beginning, you say, "Well, it's difficult to read Benjamin. Like, you can't just pick up a work of Benjamin and just read it one off. You have to have a sense of, you know, his whole corpus. And he's not right. the only author like that. So really, like, you could look at Ivan Illich, you know." You can't really just read one work by Ivan Illich. There's late Illich, early Illich. They have a relationship, right? Like a, absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, whatever. The examples are legion, okay? And that requires a relationship with the material, which is inimical to how we generally now encounter text, which usually is through the internet. And it's 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 almost like fascinating how the internet changes our relationship with texts where you always have the links and the hyperlinks, right? So you can't just like read, 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 read. And then there's a link and you go to the link. You're like, there's this like fracturing of the process. It's destabilizing. Yeah. And this yeah. fracturing and destabilizing, I think is fundamentally corrosive. It affects our relationship with everything okay yeah. uh and um and uh i mean there is that second point of hope that the the ruling classes don't escape the effect of this technology they themselves are also compromised by their involvement with it and yeah. probably to even higher degree than the average individual who is still embedded within the sphere of uh, proletarian engagement Okay, so the, no, it, but I think I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, I think that, I think that the can be leveraged as a point of resistance if you want to think tactically, right? You got to return to the analog. The analog is the front of resistance, but yeah, um, it's interesting. You know, I have said that very thing that I think the effects of the internet of the all these platforms social media, the effects of that whole enterprise has been much greater for the people who own it, the 1%, than it has been for everybody else. I can't really defend that, but, but it's interesting that you're saying something like that too, because it's just how it feels somehow. Now, you can in terms of reading, of pardon? Time. Yeah. No, just, no, I was just saying like it, to, it, just to supplement your point. Like you can yeah. watch some of these talks that they give at their summits. I remember watching one. There's a WEF summit, and I can't remember her name. She teaches at Duke University, and she was talking about these earbuds that you can put in, and she was very excited about these earbuds that could be used to monitor neural frequency and the relative attention of workers so that. Now workplaces you can monitor, and, and like the thing about like you know, she's so excited about it with no irony whatsoever. 
She didn't no. seem to have any sense that she was talking about a massively dystopic technology that was just literally going to infect people's minds to make them more effective insects in the hive, right? She didn't have any awareness. She thought this is a great opportunity for business owners, especially at scale, to enhance the production of their workers. She was completely captured by the yeah. ideology of this <laughs> madness and seemed completely bereft of any awareness that the, what she was talking about is anti-union. I'm sorry if I'm getting like exercise. No, like, but 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 right. it's it's amazing to me uh, because I have heard that similar things. And there was a speech the other day, someone was giving about a new technology. Same thing. These earbuds, and they will be able to tell when your attention wavers. And so it's really good for workers because we can get them back on track and focus on their job. And but, you know, this horror, horrifying dystopian vision, and, and it was being pitched as progress. Uh, so, but I remember being at a conference about actually about le the legal issues around AI and, and whatnot, but that's not the point. Somebody was giving a lecture and he said, well, I mean, there are uses for androids, for robots. They can go to nursing homes and serve as companions oh, to the elderly. God. And I thought, I thought, this is, you're not horrified by this? I said it to him. I said, because I find that horrifying, blood curdling, nightmarish vision yeah, I, that you just described. With Lex Friedman, where he was talking about the same phenomenon with a mathematician about the use of chatbot technologies to give solace to incredibly depressed people. I even heard that there was like a suicide. <laughs> There was a suicide, no, it was an eating disorder, an eating disorder hotline that had, had decided to, to sack its, its actual team because they now had programmed a chat bot to handle the bulk of the call guard. And I'm like, yeah. it's, and it's like, how, how far got do you have to be to see that this is just going, I mean, they even have to, explicate what is wrong with that is an astonishment right You're but like, this is this is uh, you know this is very much the 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 topic i think that we are talking about this height this this marketing advertising of artificial intelligence and all its various incarnations and it's being uh, presented as a panacea to all kinds of social ills and problems, everything from mental health to unemployment to homelessness, everything is being cured by artificial intelligence. And let's see, so let's and, come back and, to the and, yeah. yeah, and of course, the fact is that these things don't work. The ear bugs that are supposed to help you know, keep keep workers attentive. Don't work. They but but as long as those workers believe they work, then they work, right? In right. terms of the, the owners like cameras, of, right. of the factory, and they just want them to work. It's like it's, those old CCTV cameras that were fake, empty. They used to put up in stores to convince people not to steal because they were being watched. Most of them were empty. Didn't matter if you if you thought it was there. It, it, I think I think we are circling around this this question, this topic that is at the heart of it all, I suppose, and and that is uh, what what is what is so malignant, so destructive that is embedded in this idea of progress. And that at some point, that is what has to be overturned because it's it's deeply ingrained in Western culture and Western society that we are moving forward on this linear 
sort of Christian path of progress. And, and it is, yeah, it is, it is very hard to shake people free. It's interesting that Ted Kaczynski died this week, last week, um, the victim of MK Ultra. He certainly sounds less crazy than he did um, when he issued his manifesto. Uh, that the there is something very problematic with with electronic technology as it has evolved. Um, again, Jonathan Beller is somebody very worth reading, Cinematic Mode of Production, The Message is Murder. He's, I don't agree with everything Beller says at all, but, but he's, I think, essential reading because he, he, he outlines rather clearly how that evolution in technological innovation took place, how and why it took the directions that it took. For instance, cameras partly were used as a justification for the slave trade, uh, for police cataloging of suspicious individuals, social control, et cetera. It's, it's very useful to, to track that and, and look at the situation today with the internet, a military invention, of course, as we know. Uh, it, I have no, I have no punchline to this, but I think that's where, well, that's where the analysis should should. That's where the we should focus analysis is what is wrong with technological progress. What is wrong with the general belief, unshakable belief in that progress. Well, I think uh, the kind of paradox is, is that uh, it actually destroys our relationship with history. Uh, it, 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 uh, we need to reclaim the historical, but to reclaim the historical, historical consciousness and engagement and embodiment, which is what will actually that's to a better future. Um, demands rejecting the myth of progress, at least the, as this myth has been enshrined within this sort of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's this derivative, uh, I don't even know, yeah. futurism, right? Um, yeah. it, so it requires, have requ I mean, it all sounds so soap and water when I say it, right? Like these are cliches, I know they're cliches, but I can't get around it, right? But, you, you know, if you have to say it, you have to say, well, we have to reclaim our relationship with our own bodies and our limitations and our finitudes. We have to live in actual relationship with other human beings. It's like, okay, yeah, well, that's, of course, right? That, that's obvious. And, uh, and sorry, I didn't start yet. And, and, <laughs> no, and, it's good. And, and so, uh, but it's also, it's just, it's just not, and so it's, it's, it's insidious, right? You almost have to just have a faith in, because you can't, you can't, it's very tempting then to try and use the, the tools of the enemy, if you like. It's very tempting to say, well, how can I present this rhetorically? How can I be persuasive? And I mean, that's well, fine as a point of departure, but you have to be very careful because otherwise you'll get sucked into the very logic you're trying to combat. And, and, and yeah. Uh, it's no, this is also a very astute observation, and and uh, this so again is like you have something. to have faith that just enacting this in your own life with the people, in places who you are, will create a kind of well. But you know, it's but it's it's probably even deeper and 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 more difficult to to. Uh, to outline or define than you are saying. It's not just that, that one wants to use the arguments or logic of the enemy of the system that one is part of, because of course you're going to, you're part of it. We're all, we can't escape it. We can't step outside of it. We, we do our best to, 
you find a place with a perspective that is radical enough to, to have some clarity about what's going on, we hope. But, but we are living in the midst over the last, I would say, 20 years and certainly over the last four, three, four years, we are in the midst of a massive transformation in, in social relationships. And people, people are, what is it, one in four Americans takes antidepressants, some astonishing figure. We are seeing incredible rise in self-harm among teenagers, suicide in youth, uh, clinical depression across the board. Uh, we are in the midst of, of like biblical homelessness in the United States, something that just, there is a kind of collective denial about. People are buffeted and assaulted with these fears and fear mongering, methane bubbles are going to, so asteroids are going, there's a runaway black hole in the center of the universe. There's a new pandemic on the horizon. Uh, don't throw those old masks out. You're going to need them to get on and on and on. The marketing of fear is profound. And so that's going on. People are more alienated from each other. There's, there's objective evidence of this. People spend less time in, in social gatherings, having dinner with friends. Uh, teenagers have less sex than they used to. They are terrified of the other people because of partly the way the climate agenda has been, has been pitched. People see humanity as a blight on the planet. We, we have seen the enemy and he is us, the old Pogo comic. This was the beginning of all the overpopulation people came up with that and hammered on it for years. That somehow humanity is the problem. And uh, if, if we just ate crickets and then could curb cow farts, uh, everything would be okay. It's very interesting because what never gets mentioned is the U.S. war machine, the the you know the the single largest consumer of uh, oil products, gasoline, petrol, the most produces more toxicity globally than in groundwater, land, everywhere, destroys oceans, destroys environments, pollutes everywhere it goes. U.S. has 900 military bases around the world. They're all toxic. But I hear very few, if any, climate activists well, talk I mean, about the U.S. military. You know? I think, I mean, unfortunately, we're running up against temporal finitude here. So we're about to okay. wrap up in a yeah. moment. Um, because obviously we're just like getting started. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I mean, I just want to point out something else, which does not, in my mind, uh, get enough attention is, uh, well, there's, there's, there's two points here I'm going to try and make quickly as far as I can. Is one is that in my view, uh, the, the narrative of psychiatry and you can distinguish between say like the psychological and the psychiatric disposition. Okay. You know, this is the sticky wicky, but I'm going to say psychiatry, the biomedical model of human health, which is exemplified by psychiatry is absolutely one of the most vile and damaging aspects of contemporary American and Western culture, because what it does is it, 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 it cows people into a sense of remarkable passivity. And I, 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 I despise it. I despise it and reject it, okay, uh, outright. And, and I, I, yeah. that, that doesn't really get addressed. You do sometimes, there are people who know who R.D. Lang is, okay, but it's that, this is deeper than R.D. Lang, okay. And no, you don't want to throw the baby out with bathwater, okay? But there's that. Go ahead. And yeah. then the 
the second point regarding it is bigger, like you said, the US military never gets involved, but also the notion of, and you sort of touch about this in some of your essays, right? The climate change, but the problem is that climate is like, a, climate change acts as, a, as an empty signifier. There's never a right, concrete right. analysis of what is actually going on. You're not looking at a right. specific factory, which is poisoning the water supply of a proximate community, for example. No, there's this ambient. It's an abstract. Now, yeah. all right. So there's, uh, it's, 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 uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay. Now, I mean, yeah. to, be, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, okay. I was never, I hadn't thought much about climate change until, look, I was already, I feel relatively disillusioned at the outset of the madness is what I call it the past three years. I don't even like using that word that begins with a C. It already has too much power, okay? Um, but there, the, the, there are things now that I never would have questioned which have been brought to question. Like even the constitution of the narrative of climate change is like, well, now even I am like, bizarrely in conversation with people who are my political uh, enemies like oh my gosh they have a point and it's like you actually you know the it needs to be like you actually have to read the footnotes and 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 see what's really being said and that kind of goes back to what you're saying about how this actually takes a lot of work and that's not very appealing but those are like my two concluding points there. I don't well, let me just let me just a final thought, to, if yes, I might, because I, because because this is something I have written about as much as anything else over the last twenty years. First of all, there's a great book called Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby, and I met Russell a couple of times. He uh, teaches sometimes. He's getting old now at UCLA. Social amnesia is what happened to psychoanalysis from that radical political Vienna circle around Freud to when it crossed the Atlantic to the United States and was became adjustment therapy, lost all political dimension, all radical dimension, and then was medicalized and turned into this pharmacological, biomedical, neurobiological discipline. And, and what, what it did was the idea established very quickly in the US was that therapy, the self-help culture, psychiatry was there to make your life work better. In other words, adjust to the madness and, and you won't get fired from your job and all will be good and we'll give you some medication so that you don't feel anything in the meantime. That's what happened to it. Um, there's wonderful, terrific early work by um, a, a lot of the people that were around Freud and you have to kind of dig it up and so forth and Marcuse's book on him and then people like Norman O'Brien so forth. But Jacoby's book is the, the best, clearest outline of of the depoliticizing and neutralizing of psychoanalysis. Uh, and, and I encourage everybody to get it. And in terms of climate, the problem for me, because you're right, what it, the problem is that it became this abstraction, it became cultic almost. And I have a, a couple of articles that I have written specifically on computer modeling, because this is the insidious uh, uh, sort of totem religious fetish uh, for much of the, the climate uh, fear mongering is, but we have computer models. Computer models are useless in terms of a global, I mean, there, you can't computer model the world. The world is vast. There's a little tidal island in the fjord here, near where I live. You could spend the next 10 years trying to computer model this little island and you couldn't do it because it's so complex. The ecology of just that little island is infinite. The earth is a wondrous, incredible and profoundly complicated uh, uh, piece of nature. And it is, it is a kind of arrogance and hubris in 
in this this misguided misguided digital scientism that has that has created has created this kind of one dimensional cult like uh, agenda of and 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 God forbid that you you question it because questioning in general is no longer allowed. So that's it's my last fascinating. Story how it all hangs together, how even there you're, you're brought back into the digital with the, the idolization of the computer model, right? The, yeah. The map has become dominant as opposed to the territory. Well, John, uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to sort of- No, listen, thank you. Conversation. No, I, I, I appreciate it so much and it's always fun and this was, was greatly enjoyable. Thank you. Outstanding. So hopefully we can do a follow up. Maybe we can anytime just talk, you talk, like. talk anytime about anytime you like. So all right. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and end it here, and uh, I'll uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Bye.